If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're in week 2 of a series right now called Field Guide for a Follower. And this series just asks the question, what does a real authentic follower of Jesus look like? So we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1. By the way, if, you, if you're in here and you don't have a Bible, uh, there are free Bible apps on your smartphone. And so YouVersion and Read Scripture are two really, really good ones. Uh, but we also have paper copies that are yours to keep if you want. You can just ask somebody on the way out. We'd love to give you a Bible as a gift to you. Uh, but the words will be also on the screen here. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 says this, Paul, Savanus, and Timothy... To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The series asks the question, what does the real thing look like? What does the real deal look like? What does it look like when you are an authentic, bona fide, like real follower of Jesus? So I want to start today as we talk about the second thing, the second marker of a real Christian, by telling you about a guy named Ignis Semmelweis. His name is as boring as it sounds, yes, but his story blew my mind the first time I heard it. Ignis Semmelweis was a doctor, and he oversaw two birth wards. So women giving birth to children, you know, in a hospital like, like you do. And uh, <laughs> I'm done with those days. Uh, and, uh, and so he oversaw these two birth wards in the same hospital. And for the most part, they were nearly identical in the way they worked and the way they operated. But there was one problem. One of these birth wards, everything operated well. There were healthy babies being born, healthy mothers. Everyone was going home. Everything was happy. Life was good. But the other birth ward was seeing all kinds of deaths, all kinds of issues. In fact, this birth ward over here had 20 times the number of deaths as that birth ward over there. And this guy, this physician that oversaw these birth wards could not for the life of him figure out why the heck there would be such a difference. It bothered him as it should as a doctor. And so he decided to dive into this, to really study why would there be such a difference between these two wards? They operate the same, they have the same policies, they have the same procedures. He couldn't figure it out. Until one day, he noticed something. He noticed something small and seemingly insignificant at the time. He noticed that in the birth ward over here that was having all the deaths, that before the doctors would deliver babies, many of them were in a morgue doing autopsies and coming right over to deliver babies after that. And a lot of these babies and these mothers were dying of the same diseases that those people that he was doing autopsies on had died from. You see, this was back in the 1850s where they did not have microscopes and they didn't understand the world of germs and sanitation and uh, and antiseptics and all of those things. This was before we had the knowledge that we have today and he could not figure it out. And Ignis Semmelweis is one of the people that is responsible for our understanding of hand washing and germs. He literally helped write the field guide on sanitation. Now, why do I share that story? I share that story because germs are this subtle, almost invisible thing that are so powerful. That literally bacteria can be the difference between life and death. It is such a powerful force in our world of medicine and hospitals. And the same thing is true of Christians, that there is this subtle yet powerful marker of every single follower of Christ that if you are a Christian in this room, you share in common with other Christians. No, it's not. It's germs. It is germs, but it's not germs. (laughs) One single thing that you share in common. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. This one thing that we all share in common if we are Christians. Now, Here's the deal, if you're in this room and you are not a Christian, you haven't put your trust in Jesus, maybe you're here and you've spent a lot of your life kind of mad and angry at Christians. You've been hurt by many of us in the past. I wanna say to you first and foremost, um, I'm sorry. Like, I think a lot of us have walked through that, a lot of us have experienced that, and I feel like 
um, as a pastor, but also as a Christ follower, it's just, it's part of my role to just say, you know what, when people don't represent Jesus well, we are sorry for that. And my hope is, is that you're sitting here in this room and you're not a Christ follower. My hope is that today you might actually listen and something you hear might actually transform something inside of you, shift something inside of you, so that at the very least you can say, oh, that, that's what the real thing looks like. Like, I've experienced a lot of the fake thing, but that's what the real thing looks like. And so we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians once again. I began with chapter 1, verse 1. But this thing that we're talking about today, it impacts everything in our lives. It impacts the way we work. It impacts the way we parent. It impacts the way we experience tragedy and loss. It impacts the way we view the past, the present, and the future. In fact, everybody in the world is desperate for this one thing. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. So, I know, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18, if you want to turn there with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. It says this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, if you've been a Christian for a while, you're probably pretty familiar with this passage. In fact, you might have like images of like left behind movies right now in your mind and Kirk Cameron's stellar acting skills and planes that are abandoned and all of these things. And that's certainly one of the ways that the church has kind of interpreted this passage, but that's not actually necessarily why Paul wrote this passage. You know, we can obsess over the when and the how and exactly what it's gonna look like and all of those things that's a different sermon for a different day. We're not going to navigate any of that stuff today. But what I do want to navigate is why Paul wrote these specific words to these specific people. You see, the, the Christians of this time, they believed that the second coming of Christ, that Jesus' coming was at hand, that it was here in this time. And what Paul is saying to this church is, no, it, like it's not here yet. It's still going to happen in the future. It's not at hand just yet. But in the meantime, I want you to live a certain way. While you are waiting, while you are wondering when Jesus is going to return, I want you to live in a very specific way. And so last week we talked about how the number one marker of a follower of Christ, a real Christian, is that we have lives that look like his. That we are imitators of Jesus. That we love who he loved and we go where he goes and we spend time with the people and the type of people that he spent time with. The number one marker of a follower of Christ is that we look like him. It's the call of Jesus to be a disciple, to be an imitator of him. But then the second marker of a follower of Jesus, the second thing that we have to understand if we're going to be real deal, authentic followers of Christ is this, that we live a life marked by hope. A life marked by hope or a confident expectation that God will come through that God is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he's going to do. Hope. Hope is the second marker of a real, authentic follower of Jesus. And Paul, over and over and over again in these books, First and Second Thessalonians, writes to this church again and again and again, and he talks about hope. And he says, the way you live must be flavored with hope. Even the way you grieve must be filled with hope. The way you work, the way you parent, the way you're married, all of it, if you are a follower of Christ, is filled with hope. Even your suffering, even your suffering is marked 
by hope. Hebrews describes hope as an anchor for the soul. The hope that we have in Jesus as an anchor for the soul. Now, if you know anything about anchors, anchors, they don't prevent storms, do they? They don't prevent hardships. They don't prevent difficulty. They don't prevent darkness. But they are a foundation that holds a ship in place. Hope in Jesus is a foundation, an anchor for the soul. Now, some of you, some of you are here thinking that fluffy hope stuff (laughs) sounds great, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know the type of hopeless junk that I've walked through. And you're right. I don't. I don't know some of the stuff that you've walked through. But I know what I've walked through. And I know what others who have gone before me have walked through and the way that they found and experienced real, authentic hope. But we cannot talk about hope unless we're willing to talk about hopelessness. So I want to introduce you to a second guy this morning. His name is Viktor Frankl. Has anybody heard of Viktor Frankl in this room? So a few of us. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychologist who lived during Nazi Germany. And... He spent a lot of time in concentration camps as a prisoner. He spent time in three different concentration camps, one of which is Auschwitz, the the worst one. Now, if there is a a reason for hopelessness, that would be it, right? Like spending time as a prisoner in Nazi Germany, that is a place of darkness and hopelessness. And being a psychologist, Victor would observe and he'd look at these other prisoners And he'd observe their behavior. And he'd observe how they operated and moved throughout the camps and live. And Victor and his friends got to this point where they could predict almost to the day when somebody was going to die. Almost to the day. You see, in the camps, cigarettes were currency. They would trade cigarettes for food, for clothing, for different things. They were the currency in these camps. And what Victor and his friends observed was that when somebody started smoking their own cigarettes, they had given up hope. That no longer were they living this currency, no longer were they exchanging and moving throughout the camps, but they were smoking and they would reach their last cigarette and they would die often in a matter of days. And what Victor wrote about after his time in these camps is that as a human being, you can have your dignity stolen, you can have your freedom stolen, You can have everything about your identity stolen, but as humans, we need hope to survive, don't we? We need hope. We need a reason for living. Have you ever been in a season of hopelessness? Have you ever experienced hopelessness, like real legitimate darkness and hopelessness before? I know I have. And one of the things that I think is so true about hopelessness is there's three beliefs that we often have when we're living in seasons of complete and utter hopelessness. Three beliefs that we have about our situation. Number one, it's that our situation is permanent. That this will never look any different than it does now. That my experience of this painful situation will never be any different than it is than what I'm experiencing here and now. Hopelessness is defined by this belief that our pain is permanent. Second one is that hopelessness is defined by a belief that our experiences and our circumstances are pervasive. That they impact every single part of ourselves, that they impact every single thing that we are, that there is nothing off limits from this season of darkness and hopelessness about who we are. The third and final piece of this is that hopelessness is personal. That for many of us, when we're walking through seasons of hopelessness, we take on that hopelessness as an identity. That it is who we are. I want to go back to the Thessalonian church here. As we talked about last week, this was a church that knew hopelessness. 
Paul says you received the word, the gospel, in much affliction, and yet still your lives are defined by hope. If you want to go back to that slide real quick for me, Holly, what if the Thessalonian church, what if they would have lived as though their circumstance was permanent? If they would have lived as though their circumstance was permanent, as if there was never anything that was ever going to be any different about their circumstance. Paul writes to this church and he says, your circumstance is not permanent. Your circumstance is not permanent. There is a future hope that is coming because of your identity in Jesus. Do you have the ability to throw that back up, Polly? The three, the three things? Sorry, <laughs> I didn't explain that well. Perfect. So what if, what if they would have believed that? Paul writes over and over and over again that there is a future of hope that is coming because of Jesus. And there, that in and of itself is reason to experience hope here and now. What if they would have believed that their experiences, their circumstances were pervasive? That this persecution and this danger and this death and this hardship that they were walking through was it. That it was all of who they are. There's a reason that Paul spends so much time talking about an identity in Christ, not taking on the identity of your circumstances, but taking on the identity of who Jesus is and grounding your hope as an anchor for the soul in that. Personal. Paul addresses work and family life. He addresses relationships, the way we grieve, the way we experience suffering. He says, your hopelessness is not all of you. It's not who you are. And so let's, let's talk about us for a second. Let's talk about you for a second here. Is your life marked by hope? Is your life marked by hope? Because I know, I know personally, there are people sitting in this room, I've heard your stories, who are walking through legitimately hopeless feeling situations right now. Legitimately. And what I don't want you to hear this morning is just trust in Jesus and everything is magically wrapped up with this bow and everything's good and no, that's not Christian hope. Christian hope isn't avoiding the storm. It's not going around it. It's not denying the pain. It's not denying the seasons of hopelessness that we walk through. Christian hope is being led through the storm. I think about the words in Psalm 23, where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Isn't that incredible? That the seasons of hope and the, se the seasons of hopelessness and the seasons of difficulty and challenges that we walk through, whether it be marriage challenges, challenges of past and current abuse, lost job, a lost family member, an addiction, that we're not promised, we're not promised no storms in life. What we're promised is a shelter from those storms. The scripture doesn't say that we avoid the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say you go around it or you go over it. It says you lead me through it. And that on the other side of that, there is hope. And there is joy. And there is reason to celebrate. And so I want you to hear this this morning is that hopelessness is real and it's painful and it's difficult and it hurts like hell but it does not have to be final it does not have to be final Paul's words to the Thessalonians are yes your life and your circumstances they're difficult and they're dark and they're filled with suffering and they're filled with affliction but your lives they're marked by hope Hope that others are seeing. Hope that others are experiencing because of your testimony of Jesus. And if there is one person in the, in the entirety of Scripture who was no stranger to human hopelessness, to the darkness, it was Jesus himself. 
Jesus knew what it looked like to walk right into the middle of human hopelessness, human darkness. In fact, Jesus was at the center of one of the darkest and most hopeless days in human history. Imagine you followed Jesus for three years. You had given your life to him. You'd see him him experience and, and perform miracles and healing and teaching and compassion. You saw him talk about tough love and walk alongside people in their pain and their brokenness and their darkness. You would hear him teach about this kingdom that's here and how he's the king and all of these things. And then one day you find yourself having devoted your lives to this man and you find him hanging on a cross, brutally beaten, naked, shamed, And you find yourself in the darkness there, staring up at him, an innocent man hanging there, his blood dripping to the ground. What would you be feeling in that moment? Hopeless, wouldn't you? In fact, that's what his followers did feel. Many of them abandoned him. Only a few were around at the foot of the cross that day. You see, the reality of the cross is painful, and it's dark, and it's heavy, and it's seemingly hopeless. Yet today, that's not how we talk about the cross. We talk about the cross as a symbol of hope, as a symbol of healing, as a symbol of victory, of new life. Why? Because hope is a confident expectation that God will come through. That even in the darkest of days, the story is not done yet. (laughs) And I may not see it. And I may not understand it. And it may suck right now. But hope is coming. It is always coming in Jesus. That for many of us, today may be Friday. Today may be in the darkness. Today may be in the hopelessness. But there is a new day that is coming. There is a new hope that is coming. Story's not finished yet. And the cross is hope because it's God's love offered to you and to me. It's God's love poured out to every single person that has ever lived. The cross is hope because it's God's love poured out for you and for you. And for you, and for you, there's no person that God's love wasn't poured out for on the cross. Amen. And so, do you believe that your story is finished? Do you believe that what you're walking through right now, what you're experiencing right now, is all there is and all there's ever going to be? Because what you hope for it determines and it shapes and it forms what you live for. What you hope for determines what you live for. Few of you may have heard about this story that kind of, kind of radiated around the church world this last week. A guy named Jared Wilson. He's a pastor of a, of a large church. He's done a tremendous amount to shape how we understand mental health and walk through depression and anxiety and things like that. And this past week, Jared actually committed suicide. A pastor. And if there's any symbol of hopelessness, it is that. And I've shared a little bit of my journey and my story, but it was a year ago for me where I was in a really hopeless situation. It was really dark for me. And I've shared a little bit of my story with depression and anxiety, but man, guys, it was, it was really bad. A year ago, I was laying on a couch every day after work just sobbing for hours, paralyzed, unable to move. I remember like going upstairs and just falling asleep for the night at like 4 p.m., which sounds wonderful (laughs) to some of us, but it was just this, this overwhelming 
anxiety and fear and hopelessness that just gripped every single part of me. I remember Sam, my wife, would send our girls upstairs to try to cheer me up, try to get me to just get out of bed, to come down and eat something, and I couldn't do it. For the first time a year ago, I had contemplated actually taking my own life. I know what hopelessness feels like. And I know what it's like to live in the darkness. And I know what it's like to feel overwhelming hopelessness and darkness and despair. And what I realized for my own life and this was a turning point for me, is that I had no vision for my life for the future. I had no vision for where I was going, where I was headed, and what God wanted to do in and through me. All I could see was a permanent, pervasive, personal, hopeless situation. And I remember Sam pleading with me, like begging me, Brad, go talk to somebody. Brad, go see a counselor. Brad, go talk to a friend. Brad, go talk to another pastor. Brad, don't struggle through this alone. And that was a turning point for me. When I realized and I recognized that there's hope. That for my life as a follower of Jesus, hope it needs to infiltrate everything that I do, everything that I am, everything that I believe. And it doesn't take away the darkness of the hopelessness. But what God does is he enters into those spaces for us. And he provides a way out. And sometimes that journey is slow. Sometimes that journey is painful and hard. But the mark of a follower of Jesus is that God is who he says he is, even when I cannot see it. And that he will do what he says he will do, even if I cannot feel it in this moment. That in Jesus, I always, always have hope for things to come. And because of that, hope is possible for me here and now. So as we close, as we wrap up this morning, I want to just, I just want to ask two questions of you. I think there's two groups of people in this room, those of you that are following Christ and those of you that are not Christ followers. The first question is this, do you have a vision of hope for your life? Do you have a vision of hope for your life? The second question for those of you that maybe aren't Christ followers in this room, is do you have an anchor of hope in your life? Do you have an anchor of hope in your life? Paul in Romans writes these words. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. Guys, over this last year, God has done something so powerful and incredible in my life. He's given me hope. Hope that if you were to tell me a year ago that was possible, I would have thought you were crazy. Hope that he is leading me somewhere, that he is doing something with me. And that same exact hope, it's available to you. 
So I just want to invite you this morning. We're, we're going to have two opportunities to respond. Number one, if you are not a follower of Jesus in here, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to that hope this morning. This is a group of people in this room who are walking through some heaviness, walking through some darkness, who would love to walk alongside you and journey with you in that season. And so if you have never trusted in Jesus before, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a minute from now to, to pray through that and to put your hope and your trust in him for the first time. But there's others of you in this room who have already trusted in Jesus, that you've already put your hope in him. And one of the most common practices in the church is to share your testimony. It's to share your story of what God has brought you from and what he has brought you to. But you know what one thing that we don't do often enough in the church? Is we don't talk about where we're going. Part of our story is where we believe God is leading us. We call this a vision of hope for our lives. And I remember doing this for the first time a few years ago where I actually started writing out, it's a powerful thing to do, where I started writing out, God, where do I see my faith in a year from now? God, where do I see my faith in two years from now? And you just dream, and you just spend time with God as to where he's leading you. And this exercise, it produces hope and it allows you to define and to dream about where God is doing and where he is leading you. And the coolest part is you can look back and you can see what he has done and what he is leading you to. And so I wanna invite you, if you are a Christ follower in here, to share your story of future hope with us. There's gonna be a link right there, newlifewayland.org slash hope. And I want you to just share your story. Where is God leading you? What is God doing in your life? I want my inbox flooded with stories of hope from people in this room about what God is doing and where he is leading you. Dream big. Don't hold back. Because I believe when we do this, God is going to do the miraculous in our church, in our town, and beyond. So I'm going to share mine, and then we'll pray and we'll close. This is what I wrote for myself. Just yesterday I wrote this. In one year from now, I have dreams for my family, for my life, and for this church. And I wrote this not as a pastor, I wrote this as just a regular guy, okay? In one year from now, I dream of my foster son, Theo, being permanently adopted. Over the next year, I wanna be slower to speak and faster to listen. Over the next year, I want to read through the Gospels again. The story of Jesus is found in the Gospels, but not just skim through them, wrestle through them. Spend time soaking in Jesus' teachings, wrestling through the hard things that he said, wrestling through the things that make me uncomfortable, and letting his words inspire hope and transformation within me. I want to live with urgency, building relationships with people in this town who are far from God. My goal is to share the gospel with one new person a month, and no Sunday mornings do not count. What's your story of hope? What's your story of what God wants to do in you and through you as you look at the next year ahead of you? Again, I want to invite you this week, write that link down and share your story. It doesn't have to be long, it doesn't have to be perfect, and it does not have to be elaborate. But let's dream big together as a church. The band's going to make their way back up, and I would love to pray together. Again, if you have not put your hope in Jesus, this is a great time to do that this morning. And I will be available, Brandon up here. I didn't tell you Brandon, but other Brandon will be available <laughs> afterwards as well. And we'd love to just talk with you. We'd love to pray with you, and we'd love to spend time putting our hope in Jesus together. Let's pray. God, we praise you, and we celebrate this morning that you are an anchor for our soul. That hope in you is a hope that has eternal implications. It's a forever kind of hope 
that whatever we're walking through this morning, whether it be grief or work struggles or difficulty, God, I pray that you will meet each and every person exactly where they are at, exactly how they need you right now. And God, we praise you and we put our hope in you and we believe with everything that you are, that you are not done yet. That you are still working, that you are still speaking, that you are still active in our lives and in this church and in this community. And it's in that spirit and that hope that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. amen.